What they found was that, you know, selling a story that makes people angry and telling them that if you keep tuning in, um, it's somehow you're part of the process. You're 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 part of the ongoing prosecution of this this cultural enemy that we're showing you. And and Fox shot to the top of the ratings as a result of that. And they stayed there up until a couple of years ago, I think, or last year, um, as a result of that. And news organizations learned that this is this is the formula for success. Welcome back to part two of our discussion of the decay that has beset American journalism with Matt Taibbi, the author of Hate Incorporated, How and Why the Media Makes Us Hate One Another. Last week, we discussed the shattering of the old forms of media manipulation and the rise of a new media landscape built around demographic silos that sell internecine conflict. The result, Taibbi points out, is a bifurcated public that is addicted to hating each other. This new media landscape still manufactures consent, but by setting group against group, a consumer version of what George Orwell in 1984 called the two minutes of hate. Our opinions and prejudices are skillfully catered to and reinforced, aided by a detailed digital analysis of our proclivities and habits and sold back to us. It is, Taibbi writes, packaged anger just for you. The result is political impotence, a fractured and disempowered public crippled by hate and fear and mesmerized by the fake dissent of the culture wars and conspiracy theories rather than genuine dissent. The moral swamp is fertile soil for demagogues such as Donald Trump, who is a creation of this media burlesque and feeds our emerging corporate totalitarianism. So let's talk about where we are. We talked last week about the antecedents and the arrival of 24-hour news, Fox, and the digital universe. And we touched on, or you touched on, how uh, this shattered uh, the, the common unity of the media into competing uh, narratives, mm -hmm. which increasingly became more strident. So mm -hmm. talk about the rise of this new media landscape. Well. There were some important events uh, that, that led to this situation. I think one of the first stories that kind of taught the, the news business that you could, you could actually sell anger as a product um, was the Lewinsky scandal, right? So you have... Um, Let me just interrupt, because in your, which I learned from your book, this is how MSNBC yes. shot expanded their audience. Right, Lewinsky. exactly. Yeah, they had a, they had a nightly... White House Report, right, or White House in Crisis. I forget what the name of the show was. It was hosted by Keith Olbermann, in fact. And the, the you know, MSNBC was basically just selling the idea that this incredibly important thing was going on and there was this heated battle and the presidency was hanging by a thread. And what they were trying to do is basically create the impression that Watergate was going on and you better tune in because at any moment this could all go kaput and we've, we've just been through With exactly Russia some similar right. thing. Um, and they got enormous market share just from, from that approach. Fox added a twist to it, though. Fox, Fox took the same concept, and they openly villainized the characters. They, they decided to make uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton uh, into sort of caricatures and car cartoon figures. Well, you call them, like, hip what? Old hippies or something? Yeah, yeah exactly. Right? Yeah, aging, aging hippies. Aging Fle hippies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fle Fleetwood Mac uh, <laughs> listening. And, you know, and, and of course, they, they kept running clip after clip of Hillary Clinton talking about how she didn't bake cookies. And, and they knew that their audience was going to react to, to all these images in a certain way. And what, what they found was that you know, selling a story that makes people angry and telling them that if you keep tuning in, um, it's somehow you're part of the process. You're, you're, you're part of the ongoing prosecution of this, this cultural enemy that we're showing you. And, and Fox shot to the top of the ratings as a result of that. And they stayed there up until a couple of years ago, I think, or last year, um, as a result of that. And news organizations learned that this is, this is the formula for success. We, sh we, we tell you about somebody you don't like, and we keep telling you about it over and over and over again. Well, you say we sell anger mm -hmm. and conflict. Mm -hmm. And we began, you write, in the early 90s to systematically 
pry families apart, set group against group, and more and more make news consumption a bubble-like safe space simulation of the vitriolic reflex. Right, yeah, exactly. So if, if, if previously, you know, the, the Walter Cronkite model was, I'm going to deliver the, a news program for the entire family, so your stoner kid was on one side of the room and your crazy right-wing uncle was on the other side of the room and, you know, mom and dad were in the middle, the news, that broadcast was for all those people. But after the late 80s and early 90s with cable and the development of the internet, suddenly we're, we're going to individualize the news experience for all these people. So, you know, a junior can go upstairs and he can, he can read his left wing stuff and the, you know, with his Che t shirt on and your right wing uncle can turn into Fox. And, and now all of a sudden you can read news that, that, that agrees with everything that you think. And as you point out, it's not reporting, it's a marketing process designed to create rhetorical addictions addictions, and you're right, and shut unhelpfully non-consumerist doors in your mind. Uh, this creates more than just pockets of political rancor. It creates masses of media consumers who've been trained to see in only one direction, as if they had been pulled through history on a railroad track with heads fastened in blinders looking only one way. Yeah, and this is, this is something that drives me crazy as a reporter, that people don't understand that when they turn on the news or click onto a site, that they're consuming a consumer yep. product you know I mean it's 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 mind-boggling to me that people don't understand that they're being sold something and that they themselves are are also a product right because every time you you, you read the news or watch the news you're all you know they're getting information but, about but, you that they're selling to someplace yeah, else but also that addictive quality mm -hmm. which I think you're you're dead on and this we just got two years of Russiagate as a prime example of this you have to keep tuning in yeah, because the republic is in danger. Right. Uh, you know, whichever side you're on. Right. Right. And and you know, there there've been studies already that show that you know, even without the vitriolic content, just the process of surfing and and consuming the news has a lot of the same qualities as other addictions like smoking cigarettes or taking drugs. People get uh, addicted to the feel of their phone, they get a, addicted to the process of turning on screens, but you especially get addicted to the idea that you're going to turn on to a news program or, or read an article and it's going to tell you something that's going to anger you even more than you were yesterday. And you say the template for this is professional wrestling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, re wrestling w w was was a, 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 a commercial formula that they figured out worked incredibly well. They, they, it was a simplified morality play where there was a, a, a good guy who was called the babyface and there was a bad guy they called the heel and they, they, they relentlessly hyped uh, the bad guy. The heel was more important oh, is, uh, in wrestling. And more popular, and, right? And more popular, always more important and more popular in wrestling than, than you know, the face. Because the, 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 the amount of tickets they can sell is, is sort of in direct uh, correlation to how much people hate the, the bad guy. And so you, you have to have um, a hateable heel in order to make the formula work. And this is, this is how news works. News works because we, we're telling you constantly about the iniquity of some other group, right? And we're always ratcheting up the, the volume and the, and the level of, of uh, vitriol. Well, I, uh, somewhere in the book, you, you talk about, you know, we talked earlier, now you are Hitler. I mean, and you have all these examples of people calling, I don't know, Clinton, you know. Right. Yeah, well, because with with any addiction, and you know, and as a, as a reformed drug addict, I can uh, I can I can say there's a law of diminishing returns with with any any addiction. So you always have to constantly increase uh, the level of the rhetoric uh, in, in order to get people to keep coming back. So someone can't just be merely incompetent or corrupt. Uh, sooner or later, you have to get to the point where there's where you're saying there demagogues, right, authoritarians, they're dictators, right, and then finally, as Glenn Beck discovered, you have to start calling them Hitler, and Beck got to the point where he was simultaneously calling people Hitler and Stalin, right, like he, <laughs> he, 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 it wasn't enough just to have Hitler, right, so this, this is where audience, this is where this kind of media And this is, uh, we talked before the show, this is what happened, which I witnessed in Yugoslavia, that the, the competing ethnic groups in the Yugoslav economy and economic freefall sees competing forms of mass communication and demonized uh, the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
after four years of that, they started shooting each other. Right, well, and you, you talked about, right, they would, they would show nonstop reels of, of... World War II atrocities committed by the Croats or the Serbs or whoever. Yeah, exactly, and, and, and what's the purpose of this? The purpose of this is just to wind up your, your demographic as much as possible, right? And, and this works as a commercial formula, it also works politically. Uh, but as you point out, if the population you know, is a bunch of people who all have AK-47s in the house. Which they did in Yugoslavia. Which they did in Yugoslavia. This we have AR-15s. AR-15s. You're, you're, talk you're talking about the literal balkanization of the media, yeah. right? And, and But it has very dangerous consequences, which I think you agree. Right. I mean, and, you know, we're, see we're seeing it in this country. We've already seen, you know, lots and lots of these mass shootings that are, are that have been directly linked to media habits, sure. but it's going to get worse. Of course it's going to get especially when the economy tanks. Right. And you've written, everyone should read Griptopia, by the way. It's, I don't know how you can write about Wall Street, make it engaging <laughs> and funny, curse you for that. It's, uh, but it is a one. fantastic book. Anyway, but I mean, you're keenly aware of the fragility of the economic system. Right, yeah, and the, uh, I think everybody needs to understand that if you're constantly winding up audiences and telling them that they're, that that all of their troubles are, are the result of this other group that is literally Hitler, right? Li li they're literally Nazis or they're literally Stalin or whoever it is. Um, sooner or later, you know, some people are going to start picking up weapons and they're going to do something crazy. And yeah. this, this is this is why, you know, correctly, people are upset about Fox News, but they should also be concerned about other forms of media, right? Because because really the formula is similar uh, across the board. Well, there's no difference really between yeah. the conspiracy theories. That Maddow spins and and uh, Sean Hannity, they're they're equally fictitious and equally grounded in the demonization of the other. Yeah, I mean the, the this most recent iteration of MSNBC, which you know has gone through some interesting changes over the years, right? It, it markets itself as a as a left leaning uh, network, but it was in, in, so intensely pro war in 2002 that it, that it had to uninvite Jesse Ventura and Phil Donahue uh, from, from the network. But this latest thing with, with, with Russiagate and this constant hyping of a narrative that if you watch, you might learn any minute that we're going to, we along with, with, with Robert Mueller are going to take down the president. Which they knew wasn't true. Which they, which, I don't know if, I mean. Well, the, maybe, maybe it was, what do you call them, C plus? Brains. Maybe yeah. they didn't know. I don't maybe know. they didn't. I mean, maybe the, some some of the commentators may have believed it, but I mean, certainly, I think we now know that that the investigators must have been clued in pretty early that there wasn't a whole lot to this, and the idea that this was hyped over and over again, and you know, w that we did this to audiences and are unapologetic about it is, yeah, I think people have to really worry about that because we're training people to not think critically yeah. about uh, about. Uh, other and I just want to point out, you were one of a handful of reporters who relentlessly exposed this con game, um, you know, with great... And was crossings. rewarded for it by basically never being invited on television again, <laughs> on cable television again. You said, so long as the public is busy hating each other and not aiming its ire at the more complex financial and political processes going on off camera, there's very little danger of anything like a popular uprising. You say that this uh, media bifurcation and this... A kind of inculcation of, of hatred is a very effective form of social control. Sure, and this goes back to the, the sort of the age old dynamic of you know the plantation owner setting the you know yes. the poor white farmer against the well. poor black farmer, right? I mean, it's it's a it's a modernized version of that. I mean, that's a simplification well, a, little, a little bit. Well, when we come back, Kenneth Stamp in the peculiar institution written in the 50s talked about how it, there were manuals by slave holders. They knew exactly what they were doing huh. on this point. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about the state of the American media with author and journalist Matt Taibbi. King, questioning, listening, learning. You know, I've always said I never learned anything when I was talking. It's important to listen. Question more. 
The mainstream media, swarming with falsehoods, riddled with censorship and under corporate control, is incapable of truly informing its audience. It can't rise above the corrupt motives of those calling the shots. When you awaken to this fact, turn to RT America, where we dare to question more. not defanged by the corporate media. We can go after the corporations that destroy our lives, profit over people at every turn. The Redacted Tonight for me is like medicine. It's like an antidote from all the stress that the news puts you under. Redacted Tonight is a show where you can go to cry from laughing about the stuff that's going on in the world as opposed to just regular crying. We're going to find out what the corporate mainstream media is not telling you about and we're going to filter it through some satirical comedic lenses to make it more digestible. That's what we do every week. Hard-hitting, radical comedy news like Redacted Tonight is where it's at. Welcome back to On Contact. We continue our conversation about the decline of American journalism with Matt Taibbi. So you have, uh, what do you call them, your 10 rules of ten rules hate. Of hate. 10 rules yes. of hate. Mm -hmm. let's, let's run through them quickly. Mm -hmm. First, there are only two ideas. Right. So Republicans, Democrats, that's it. There's no other kind of person that exists in the world. No pacifists, no anarchists, nothing. That's, that's all we see, and they're, they're the only thing represented. The two ideas are in permanent conflict. Right, so this is the crossfire paradigm. They can argue all you want, but they can never come to an accommodation about everything. You, the, you must view con uh, politics as something w that is a permanent argument. Hate people, not institutions. Right, so we're not... We're not focusing on the, the, the sort of timeless, uh, uh, permanent nature of how the system works. We don't think about central bank. We don't think about the security state. We don't think about any of that stuff. We focus on personalities. Donald Trump versus Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And that simplifies everything and, allow, and allows us to, to not look at the bigger picture. Everything is someone else's fault. Right, right. Yeah, so this and, this, and this goes along with the other, the, the next point, which is no, nothing is Nothing every, is everybody, nothing everyone's Nothing is everyone's fault, fault right? So, so you can't have a political issue that you can't blame on the other side. If, if, that, if that issue has, uh, is a problem with many fathers, we just don't cover it. Well, you talk about the financial system. I think, uh, would you quote Nomi Prince or something, but it, yeah. it's, it's, that's both sides right. ha have created the financial debacle that we're in, uh, but we can't report that. Right, and this was, this was why they had so much trouble with the 2008 financial crisis, because that was a crisis that was caused really by both parties. The Democrats had a huge hand in it by deregulating the, the sort of the derivatives industry, uh, but the Republicans also played a major well, role. And like in war, it. I mean, they're both. That's another thing. War, we're not going to yeah, be. exactly. They're they're in lockstep on on you know issues like everything from drone assassination right. to you know. So we just don't cover that stuff. Root, don't think. Right, so we want people to behave like sports fans because sports is a commercial formula that works. Right? So well, they've and if you look, I think it's in the book. The, they have set up the graphics and the, I mean, even like before the presidential debates, you have the people outside just like they're outside a football stadium. They've copied the very oh, totally down to the last detail. Uh, you know, if you watch NFL Sunday Countdown, you'll see the, the the sets are designed exactly the same. There's the there's the anchor on one side. There's usually. Uh, four commentators, two from each, you know, who represent each team, basically, right? Um, and then they, you know, they have graphics that tell you what the score is, who's ahead, who's behind. Um, and so we want people to perceive politics as something that is a, they have a rooting interest. And we're going to get that for the next two years, which is all oh, garbage. Yeah. It's just garbage. Yeah, exactly. No switching teams. Right. So there's, there's no... There's no possibility that of any gray area in any of this. Uh, your, your political identity can't possibly bleed into any other political identity. You are on one team or another. That's it. There's the, and, and we don't even acknowledge the existence of people who have different types of ideas, for instance, who might, for instance, be you know, 
anti-abortion, but also you know be pro-union, I mean, or whatever it is that that doesn't exist in, in media. The other side is literally Hitler. We touched on that. Yeah, a we bit. talked about this already. Yeah. In the fight against Hitler, everything is permitted. It's not really funny, actually. No, it's not. But this is the, but this is where this rhetoric leads. Right. Is you know, if you if you're d defining somebody else as that bad, then everything is permissible. And we saw this a lot with RussiaGate, where suddenly the same sort of liberal um, commentators who ages ago would have been very concerned about things like the collapse of attorney-client privilege or you know the, the FISA program or any of that stuff. They don't care about it anymore because they just want to get the person. Feel superior. Yeah, and you know this is something I talked to about with um, you know a local crime reporter, a guy named Hunter Pauly, who had to had to quit because he was constantly doing stories about people who were um, arrested but not convicted, right? And we do this and publishing their names and publishing their names, and they live forever, and they're smeared, right. and then they might turn out to be innocent. Right. We do this stuff. We, we, we do shows about people who are in trouble, people who are losers, people who will eat bugs for money, whatever it is, because we, the whole purpose of television is to make you feel good about yourself, right? And to make you feel that your ideas are right. So that's why- I, Well, and that you're smarter than everybody you're watching. Exactly, so that's why reality shows are just this pa endless panoply of morons and uh, you know who will do anything for a dollar. I mean, remember the old RoboCop routine, I'll, you know, I'll buy that for a dollar. That's what TV is, and we, we, so there's no geniuses on TV. We don't watch that because that would that would make us all feel terrible. So, you know, Trump is the is the perfect political figure. I want to talk era. about that because you say that without this new media landscape, we would have never had Trump. No, of course not. Right, Trump fits like a glove into the commercial formula of of all of this. And he, fit, and he fits perfectly for both sides. That's what's, that's what's fascinating about it. He actually probably makes more money for the MSNBC, CNN, Washington Post, New York Times side than he does for you know, Fox and the Daily Caller. He's, he's a cartoon character who is a perfect heel, all right? And he, you know, the, the other side, the reflection that views itself as the resistance to Trump, you know, it's it's the perfect situation because you have a, an, an utterly simplified political landscape where there's only two ways to be. You are either for this incredibly noxious figure or against him. But well, and you also go back to that point that you know you call him a lurid and disgusting monster freak for audiences to look down on on the other. That's and you know you see it with the they, they kind of love that disdain. Oh yeah, no, of course, and, and you can you can endlessly enjoy the the sort of descriptions of Trump. I mean, he's 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 always rendered in the most humiliating and right. ridiculous uh, you know language possible. And, you know, it was it was interesting in 2016. We started using descriptions that we would never no, use. No, in about, the time, New York Times did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. lie. I mean, that was a word we were. If we would say they claim. They claim that's and the astute reader was supposed to understand that it was, they weren't speaking the truth. Yeah, right. We never used the word lie. Right, and that was a huge controversy. And like, yet, Trump has a kind of dark genius. He knows how to play the game. He does. He does. And and, and what he's doing is he's running against the system. He he, he understands that ultimately this simplified. Um, vitriolic, hyperbolic, hyperventilating form of, of media discourse um, is, is villainous in itself. And, yeah. if, and if he positions himself as an enemy of it, he's going to do all right. You know, I mean, he, I think in 2016, when he did that, it, he was heavily emphasizing the sort of class aspect of it, right? Because reporters are mainly upper class twits who went to really good schools, uh, like both of us actually. Um, but you know, they and he sort of made the press the representative of the elite and the upper class. But he's not wrong. He's not wrong, and 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 that was the problem. We were we were never able to understand that this technique was grounded in a legitimate observation. It didn't apply to him, of course, but the, from, the, the, from the perspective of Trump's voters, he was right about that. You write, Trump reporters now regularly do the outraged hero finger pointing routine whenever they're within a mile of Trump. Jim Acosta's confrontations with the president, for instance, seem culled straight from WWE outtakes. Trump's whole presidency has turned into a heel slash hero promotion, 
with Bob Mueller in the face role. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's an important story, but the probe is also selling papers. So in essence, the we, we the media created in essence the ring. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and Trump he comes out of that world. I mean, I think you write about, was it Ed McMahon? He actually has a sort of role in some... Yeah, Vince. Yeah, yeah, Vince they, McMahon. Yeah, right? they, had, they, had a, uh, they, they actually were on WrestleMania together. Yeah. And, and, and Trump was, you know, look, as a wrestling fan, it was a great event. It was, you know, <laughs> he, he did a great job at it, which tells you something about his personality. But he has a, he has a tendency to, to sort of suck people all the people in his orbit into this WWE kind of paradigm, and you know, but, the, now, but that's what the media is. I mean, it's yeah, all there. I mean, yeah. he, we didn't. He didn't create it. It was created for him. Right. Right. And it it fit him. Right. So so all all of our worst instincts. This idea of you know we're 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 going to stick a finger in your face and we're going to be you know Jim Acosta you know flailing his arms in, in outrage. That's not being it's an just theater. It's, it's theater. It's theater. It's nothing know, be, to do with journalism. Being an aggressive, you know, confrontational right. journalist means confronting the Pentagon. Means confronting. Well, it be, you know, no, it means reporting. I, yeah. It means going out, reporting, finding stuff out. It doesn't mean being obnoxious in a press conference. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like you should let your, you know, it's sort of like Bill Belichick doesn't, you know, wave his arms and yell at people. He just he lets his team do, do the talking, you know. And I think um, the, the the posture that we've assumed, where all the histrionics and gesticulating and all that stuff, it it masks a lack of real inquiry that, that's going on. You end the book by issuing a warning. You say this is very. Dangerous. However entertaining it is, it's very dangerous. Why? Well, because exactly as you point out, with with the experience of Yugoslavia, you know, it's not a small thing to to get people in a place where mentally they're addicted to, you know, hating each other. Well, we saw some by some Trump supporter send they failed pipe bombs to that if they'd gone off would have decapitated. Most of the Democratic Party leadership. Yeah, exactly. And Ilhan Omar is having one death threat after another. Right, right. And th this is uh, this is a situation that's only going to get worse, um, especially with economic. Right. An economic crisis. Right, which is only you know it's inevitable that some yeah. that, you know our, our sort of system of bubble economics is going to produce some kind of catastrophe at some point. At which point. You know, if you tell people often enough that their next door neighbor is literally in league with Nazis or terrorists or whatever it is, and, and of course Fox pioneered this, um, you know, going back to you know the Iraq War when we were they were told you know that liberals were terrorist supporters, and um, you know s sooner or later there's there's going to be violence and uh, the inability of, of society to already agree in a common set of facts means the media has failed already, right? That means that we're just not reaching people and that we, we, we will never be able to work things out in a civil way. And so this, this, this commercial structure, which may work as a way to make money, um, you know, is not only incredibly destructive personally to people because addiction, addiction of any kind is destructive, right? You, you see people who are addicted to scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, they're miserable, right? Uh, but the, secondarily, the, the behavior that's going to result from that is, is going to be catastrophic. You, you called the election of 2016. I know at the very end you got bamboozled by I the polls, but I did. on the ground you kept saying, don't write this guy off, don't write this guy off. Uh, and in many ways, I think especially with Russia Gate, I, I think now the media can say anything about Trump, however true, um, and certainly those people who support him, there's no credibility left, they just won't believe him. Yeah, no, that, and that's, there's a serious problem with that, and this is what I said uh, a couple of weeks ago, is that, you know, if, if Mueller came back empty-handed on, on collusion, uh, right now, everybody's trying to pass it off as not that big of a yeah. deal. It's a huge deal. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, well, it's, you, it's, you pointed out correctly that it's, you know, the, the biggest blow to the press since WMD and Iraq, and you're right. And it may be fatal. It may, it may, be, more, it may be worse because the, the, what people don't understand is the spectacle of turning on the television and seeing gr panels of six to eight people openly rooting for an outcome and, and predicting that something is going to happen and telling you that it's a certainty that he's going to be convicted of crimes and then having it all turn out not to be true. 
Um, not only does that tell you that reporters are not good at their jobs and that they can't think critically, but that they're also partisans who, yeah. who, who have a point of view, and that's, that's fatal. Well, you're a great reporter, Matt, yeah. and a great writer. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. That was Matt Taibbi, author of Hate Incorporated, How and Why the Media Makes Us Hate One Another. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. <laughs>